thank you so much for the introduction and thank you uh, to the three organizers for the invitation. I'm very happy to be speaking here on February 2nd on, or 3rd, because uh, I think it's February 3rd somewhere in the world right now. Um, what I'm going to talk about is uh, joint work with Vivian Cooperman. Although when I finished preparing my slides, I realized that uh, the first half is really introducing um, the topic. Um, okay, so the object of the study today um, is the K divisor function, uh, which is defined as um, dk on n, n a positive integer, is the number of ways of writing n as a product of um, k factors. Um, now, we can see, so this, this k divisor function shows up as a numerator of the k power of the Riemann zeta function. Let me see. Um, okay, just a minute, I want to, okay. Okay, so as I was saying, uh, the, the k divisor function shows up as the numerator of the k power of the uh, Riemann zeta function. And so one motivation for studying is, is obviously if you are interested in the Riemann zeta function, um, but also it's a natural function to consider, especially the case k equals two. So the k, k equals two is, is just the number of divisors of n, right? The number of positive divisors. And so I, I made the first two slides uh, with uh, pictures so that um, to kind of introduce the topic. So here's the first one. <laughs> um, so if we consider the divisor function and we want to study um, its behavior, well, one thing we can do is to try to kind of graph it or, or, or look at what happens. And you can see it's pretty chaotic, right? Um, so it's perhaps not a very good idea to just look at values of it. So what a natural thing to do then is to try to consider some average that maybe can give us a better idea of um, how it behaves. And so this is what actually um, Dirichlet did. And uh, so here I'm talking about D, which is D2, okay, uh, from K equals two from the previous slide. Um, so if you look at the sum of dn uh, for n less or equal than x divided by x, okay, so the average, um, you can approximate this with uh, log of x plus 2 gamma minus 1, where gamma is the euler mascheroni constant. And, uh, okay, so I promise another picture, okay. So if you want to compare these things, actually, you can graph them, and it's fun. Um, so here's on the left-hand side, uh, so it's a graph of this average of D up to, um, with X up to 250. And on the right-hand side, I just uh, graph uh, this log of X plus two gamma minus one. And um, if you put two the two graphs together, uh, the two graphs together, uh, you can see that uh, they are pretty close to each other. So this is fun. Um, obviously, if we want to understand this better, okay, why stop there? Uh, we want to understand the error term. Okay, so now let's go back to the general case of the K divisor function. Um, so if we if we try to estimate this the sum of the Kn for n less or equal than x, um, we can, for example, use uh, Perron's formula and that will give a main term uh, given by, by some uh, residue of uh, the k power of the zeta function and some error term. And this, uh, this main term actually you can compute it and is um, given by x times a polynom uh, polynomial of degree k minus one evaluated in uh, log of x. And then there's this error term that is supposed to be, um, it should be smaller. And in fact, uh, one can see that it's smaller. So it's a smaller power of X. Now, uh, this term is expected to be like um, X to the one half, uh, 
minus O. So this disappears quite fast. Okay, uh, x to the one half minus one over two k, but this is actually hard to prove. Um, so an approach to study this is again, trying to do some average, okay? But um, this error term could be positive or negative. So an average that makes sense to make is to try to take some sort of, um, so this, the average of the square. So the, which in other words is the variance. Okay, so if we the, if we we square it, then we take into account. I mean, we we forget about this the minus signs that could cancel, and so we take this average, and then it is known that this uh, has the right asymptotic size um, for k equals two due to Kramer, for k equals three due to Tong, and then for k greater or equal than four under the Riemann hypothesis due to Tong. Um, so like I said, this is um, sort of the expected uh, size that uh, this error term, okay, so this is twice because I'm averaging the square, but this is the uh, expected size that this error term should have. Now, uh, what I wanted to talk about today are variants of, of this question. So the first, variance that people normally study has to do with um, distribution in intervals and in particular um, in short intervals. Okay, so what do I mean by that is that instead of taking the sum uh, over all the n less or equal than x, I take the sum on n moving in some interval between x and x plus h and the fun thing is when h is small. Um, so this is where, what is hard and what is um, interesting. Okay, so, and then the error term, well, we can, uh, we are interested in this difference. Now, um, in this context, the variance was studied by uh, various people. Um, so I just mentioned uh, names here, and I give you, I give you a statement um, in that is written, a more general statement because it's in the in the context of a conjecture in the next slide. Um, so there are results of Lester um, that for k that are under Rh for k greater or equal than three for relatively wide intervals. Um, so what, here h is bigger than x to the one minus one over k. So this would be considered um, a relatively wide inter interval. Uh, there are uh, results for k equals two um, that are like for, for uh, small intervals, okay, by uh, Utila, Coppola, Salerno, Ivig, Lester, and Yesha, Yesha sorry. Um, there is also, there are also results um, with, with small intervals that are um, like upper bounds. So it's, it's um, some upper bounds, so it's not an asymptotic uh, of the error term by uh, Milinovic and Turnash Butterbach. Um, so to summarize something that we need to keep in mind is that the interest will be short intervals. And so we are interested in H less than X to the one minus one over K. Now, in this regime, um, a few years ago, uh, Keating, Rogers, Roddy Gershon and Rudnick made a conjecture. Um, so here we take h to be x to the delta and this this delta exponent is um, strictly less than one minus one over k and the conjecture is that as x goes to infinity the asymptotics of um, this variance is given by the following uh, so there is a constant an arithmetic constant um, given by this formula uh, so this is an Euler product, so product over all the primes um, and this term, but also um, there is some sum actually coming from the gamma function. Um, then there is this pk of delta term. So that's a piecewise polynomial function evaluated in delta. So delta is my exponent of x. Um, of degree k squared minus one. So what it means is that um, this is going to be a continuous function and that is defined by pieces 
um, in intervals and um, and whenever it's defined, it's defined by a polynomial that has degree k squared minus one. And then, uh, so those are coefficients, and then there's h, okay, so, or x to the delta if you want, and then uh, log of x to the k squared minus one. Um, let me tell you a bit more about this uh, pk of delta. So this pk of delta, more precisely, um, is obtained by okay so the polynomial function originally okay i i explained this why it's written in a, in a, in this way so there's some um inversion of the variable but um this is uh, the gamma k is a polynomial function this piecewise polynomial function and it actually shows up as a very interesting integral so this is an integral of the delta, so this delta C here is the delta distribution. And I apologize that there are two deltas here that have nothing to do with each other, okay? But um, this is how the notation is coming. Um, and so this uh, will indicate, okay, so we do, this is a multivariable integral in this uh, simplex. Okay, so there are k variables and each of them moves between zero and one. And we take the delta, so we take the sum of the variables uh, when it's equal to c, okay? Uh, so that will be one and zero otherwise. And there is some uh, van den Bonde type factor there. Now, okay, so it turns out that this integral is actually uh, this piecewise polynomial function. So for example, to give you a clear example, uh, here's the case k equals two, okay? So, so you get there a polynomial of degree k squared minus one, in this case is three, okay? And so you get a certain polynomial in the interval between zero and one, and another polynomial in the interval one, two, um, outside that is zero and is continuous, right? Because if you plug C equals one, you are going to get the same value in both places. Um, now, let me talk about the other problem. So the other typical problem that one may consider when talking about um, this K device of function has to do with the sum over arithmetic progressions, okay? And in this context, again, uh, there, there are uh, various results. Um, and, okay, just wanted to mention results on the variance by uh, Motohashi, Blomer, Loan Shao, uh, Kowalski, and Ricotta. And also in the same paper, uh, Keating, Rochester, Rodity, Gershon, and Rudnick um, formulated conjecture. So again, this is for the variance. This AK is the same AK that I have in the previous uh, slide. The gamma K is the same gamma K that I've been talking about, okay? And again, we have, okay, so the gamma K now is being evaluated in uh, log of X over log of Q. So Q is the, the modulus of my um, arithmetic progression. And uh, we are summing up to X. Okay, now the question is how they come up with these conjectures. And the answer is they come up with these conjectures by studying the analogous problem over function fields. Okay, so what's the analogous problem over function fields? Well, if we have f a monic polynomial over with coefficients over fq, q is an odd prime power, okay? Uh, Two is not a prime in this talk. Uh, <laughs> um, then we consider dk of f um, defined analogously as um, over the monic polynomials as the number of ways of writing f as a product of k monic polynomials. Um, and again, this uh, dk of f uh, shows up as the numerator of the zeta function over fqt. Uh, so if we take uh, the zeta function over fqt, uh, which is given by the sum of one over uh, absolute value of f 
uh, to the S with F going over all the money polynomials, then when we take the K power, uh, we get that. And uh, here, before I go on, let me just mention that the absolute value of F here is Q to the degree of F. So it's the number of elements when you take um, the residue field of FQT by uh, the ideal generated by F. Okay, so to give a bit more context um, before presenting uh, the results that they prove and our results, etc. I want to talk a bit about um, L functions, our function fields. Um, so a main object that we use all the time uh, in this context is um, Dirichlet L functions. So let me remind people a Dirichlet character is a maldefined um, over some questions, so we have FQT, question by an ideal generated by DT, say D is a polynomial. Um, so the character K will be defined on the multiplicative uh, group there. Um, it gives you complex values and you can extend it to FQT by periodicity and um, with the condition that uh, K, uh, K of A is zero when A is not combined to D. Um, then the digit L function associated to chi uh, will be defined as the sum of chi of f over f uh, over absolute value of f to the s. And here, yes, sorry, I um, the notation m means monic. I was trying to prevent this notation uh, to to yeah to delete this notation from my slides, but I forgot here. Um, so I just want to say the sum is over f monic, just like in the definition of the um, zeta, the Riemann zeta function over fqt. Now, okay, so this is one way of uh, writing the Dirichlet L function. Um, however, we can organize this a bit better because the absolute value of f only depends on the degree of f. So you could do the sum by degree. Okay, so just from zero to infinity. Um, so the absolute value of f will be q to the n. So you get one over q to the n s. And then inside, so you get a sum, like an inner sum uh, of chi f over all the f that have harmonic of degree n. Now, this inner sum, okay, so when, when the degree of f is, is bigger than the degree of d, this is a full sum on a character. So if the character is non-trivial, this will give you zero. Um, and so what happens is that this term becomes zero when n is sufficiently large, okay? So at the end of the day, my L function that was defined in, as an infinite uh, series is actually a finite sum, okay? Well, this is one elementary way of seeing this, but um, it's actually a manifestation of, of the Bayes conjecture. So this is one of the, um, yeah, so this is one of, of the consequences of um, the Bayes conjecture. Now, uh, the next slide, uh, okay. Before I go on to the next scene, I just wanted to say, we sometimes it's convenient to make this change of variables where we call uh, q to the minus s, we call it u. So this term here becomes u to the n, becomes the power of u. And then the L function becomes a polynomial. Okay. So it's convenient to think of, of this digit L function as a polynomial. Okay, so when you when we think of it as a polynomial. Um, then, okay, so here I'm, I'm writing some lies. Uh, this is not, not uh, precise at all, but I just wanted to give an idea. Um, so it will be a polynomial of degree, essentially the degree of D. Okay, remember D was um, the modulus or, well, the conductor of my character. Um, this is, this is not, um, I'm not being precise here, but uh, say if you want an example that is more uh, concrete, if we take a quadratic character, then like the ones I'm going to use um, in my results, then um, to be concrete, we will take D to be a polynomial of degree 2G plus one. 
and then uh, the L function will have degree to G. And G will correspond to the genus of the hyperelliptic curve defined by y squared equals D. Um, but anyway, so the picture given by the vague conjectures is that this, this polynomial, uh, we can write it as a product of linear factors uh, where the reciprocal of um, the roots, this thing that I call pi j of chi, um, will have absolute value um, q to the one half, the square root of q. And so in this context, uh, one can think of, of this product as a determinant, as, as a characteristic polynomial of some matrix that after normalization, we can view it as a unitary matrix. Okay, so this, this theta of chi. And so this to give you an idea that um, this, so make these models that show up in this context. And so, and this is part of a bigger, so this is part of what is known as the Katz and Sarnak philosophy. And the Katz and Sarnak philosophy says that the statistics for the zeros in families of L functions should follow the distribution laws of classical random matrices. And I wrote here as D goes to infinity. So what I have in mind is as the genus goes to infinity. Now, some, um, some results that I'm going to use um, take a different approach, so a different limit, and they, they take Q going to infinity. So instead of D going to infinity, Q going to infinity. And so there are, uh, so these are typically, so these equidistribution results, um, they have a shape, they have the following shape. So we have a function F um, defined, so it's a C value central continuous function on some uh, matrix group. Okay, so what I mean by that is um, a function that is defined on conjugacy classes in this matrix group. And the matrix group, you have to think of it as um, unitary or, or some, uh, some group like symplectic, orthogonal, etc. And then the results, so it will be determined by, um, by the, a family of L functions. So my family of L functions, I'm going to call it in, in this very general context, I'm going to call it FD. And then um, the, the, the general result um, is that when Q goes to infinity, the average of F over the elements in FD uh, will approach the integral of FU DU over my, um, my group, okay? So this is very a general thing, okay? So it's not precise, but it's, it's a general um, a statement that then for some specific cases, there will be a theorem that we will use. Okay, so now I'm going to go back to this question that uh, Kitin, um, Kitin, uh, Rogers, Rodity Gershon, and uh, Rudnick were looking at. And uh, basically, okay, so the first question has to do with model the this average on um, short intervals. And so a way to take a short interval over um, the function field has to do with, you fix a polynomial, okay, of degree, say, n, and then you take all the polynomials that are close to this polynomial, closer than certain distance, okay? So in this case, say, closer uh, than q to the h. So what it means here, if you think about the definition of the norm, means that the highest coefficients, they coincide, okay? So up to degree, okay, so anything higher than degree h, they will have the same coefficient as A, and then the smaller coefficients can be, are free to be anything. Okay, and in this context, um, the result is that, okay, so the average can be computed exactly, and if we give the variance by this, okay, just, um, you know, the error term with the average and uh, sum of absolute value square, then um, the result, is that um, 
the variance can be written as an integral over the group of unitary matrices uh, respect to the uh, hard measure. And the integral is of the following. So the integral is of this sum. So we take the sum of products of what are called the security coefficients. These coefficients here, they are just the coefficients of a um, cert certain way of writing the characteristic polynomial. So if we take the characteristic polynomial by taking one plus x u, then those are the coefficients. And then we take the sum uh, on some homogeneous, on homogeneous weight n, and we take the absolute value square of the sum, and we integrate that, OK, uh, times q to the h, OK, times the size of the interval. Um, the general strategy for proving such a result um, actually is using um, even Dirichlet characters to pick up, actually to restrict to the interval. I'm not going to go into the details on how this is gone, uh, this is done, but um, basically the, one can relate, uh, so one can, can recover the sum of the KF by, um, by considering twisted sums by uh, by the Dirichlet characters, and so if we take the k power, we get the sum with the k, but twisted by um, a Dirichlet character, and then playing with that. Uh, well, I mean, I shall say playing, but it is uh, difficult uh, sums. But anyway, um, one can approximate the variance, one can approximate with this sum, and then use some equidistribution result that like the general result that I um, mentioned to turn this sum into an actual integral over all the uh, unitary matrices. Um, let me also mention that for the other version of the, pro the other problems, so the arithmetic progressions, there is also uh, a result that is very similar, okay, due to the same authors. Um, where again, uh, basically, they take the variance and using similar methods is not exactly the same story because now um, for arithmetic uh, progressions, they take odd characters. Um, but again, using characters, they recover this type of result. Um, now, this doesn't answer the question of how they get the conjectures because. Okay, so you can see more or less the shape, but I mean, one has to understand this integral. And so they actually work with this integral a lot. Um, so the general integral that one has to understand is this sum of uh, security coefficients to the square over uh, the unitary matrices. And um, they do, they, they take, various approaches to understand this. Uh, so one thing that can be done is to relate um, to the count of some lattice points in um, z to the k square power lying in certain convex polytopes. Um, once also to extract this gamma kc that I uh, mentioned before. Okay, so what's the relationship between this and gamma kc? Well, this has to do with the main coefficient of the asymptotic. So the size of this integral is like n to the k squared minus one. And this gamma kc that keeps popping up in all these results um, is basically the, yeah, the coefficient of this. So we take uh, c n, small n over capital N, and, uh, and basically uh, that's what we get. And this gamma kc is what, I, like I said before, this piecewise continuous polynomial function. Uh, given by this integral. Now, our project started out of um, a working group at AIM with various people. Um, we wanted to, so the, everybody was sort of interested in this um, gamma KC coefficient. And the main question was, okay, so let's study a symplectic version of it. And then the question that um, Cooper Ver and I uh, started with was, okay, so can we get, let's go back and 
let's try to get the problem that gives you a symplectic distribution. So let's go backwards. Okay, can we get symplectic distribution? So the reason, I mean, the the both pro, both results that I presented uh, by uh, Keaton, Roger, Roddy, Gershon, and Rudnick, they are um, in relation with unitary distributions, and so they come from different sides. So one is even primitive characters; the other is all primitive characters. Um, if we want to get symplectic, the natural uh, the natural set of characters will be quadratic characters. And so our first attempt was quadratic character with conductor D and D you take Monica and square free. Um, the problem with this is that uh, it's a bit hard to detect squares with this. Um, I, I mean, if D is not prime, okay, detecting squares is not so easy. And so we decided to, okay, so let's, restrict to primes okay so what about we study the sum of dkf over f monic of degree n with f congruent to square mod p and so this is what we did okay and um so to be concrete here we are going to so p prime in the context of function field means that p is a monic reducible polynomial and i'm going to fix here degree to g plus one um this is so that i i i really have a concrete set that i can relay uh to the to the modular space corresponding to the curve the hyperelliptic curves of genus g and uh, and then the result that we have is that well we can compute the the average, and then if we compute the variance, then we get um, we get a very similar integral to the ones I presented before, but now I'm integrating over the symplectic matrices of dimension two G. Okay, where again I repeat the uh, P has degree two G plus one. Okay, uh, here maybe I should mention I put a star here because the variance is not really I'm taking I'm not taking um, the difference with the average I'm taking the difference with the main term of the average uh, so this is why I put the star. Um, okay, so the ingredients in the proof. Okay, uh, as I mentioned, the idea is that while well, we use this. Um, the quadratic character, this Legendre symbol to the text square modulo P. Um, and we use an equidistribution results of cuts. Now, the original plan was to um, use the whole family of um, hyperelliptic curves. Here, however, um, when we restrict it to primes, we actually have a question about this because then you're looking into uh, y squared equals p of x and uh, so it wasn't clear that this was symplectic and then actually we went and asked Katz about it and uh, yeah and, and and he thought for some time for for a few hours and then he had <laughs> a good answer about it um, so it turns out that um, if we fix certain factorization type um, any factorization type within the square free polynomials of degree to g plus one, we actually get um, um, symplectic. Um, so basically, we consider this set to be the set of a square free. Sorry, I forgot to mention this H means a square free. So square free polynomials of degree to g plus one uh, that have certain factorization type, meaning that they can be written as a product. Uh, of monic polynomials that have degree D, di, okay, so with prescribed di's. And here, when I write this, I don't mean to say that the fdi are irreducible, okay? So they could be, you could factorize more, okay? There could be even um, thinner factorizations of this. But the whole point is that um the monodromy group of these on the one hand is included in the symplectic 
On the other hand, it contains the monodromy of um, having an, just one linear factor. Um, and this can be seen uh, to be the symplectic. So basically you sandwich this between two and you get symplectic for all these type of factorizations. And in particular, if you take, you, you can recover the primes by doing some inclusion exclusion principle. So it's actually a very nice argument, which is why I kind of spending some time on it. Um, okay, so with this result, one can go back and, and formulate a conjecture over the number phi case, okay? So over the rational. So the conjecture will be that if we have P a prime and we define, we are looking at the sum of dKn where n is less or equal than x and it goes over all the n's that are congruent to the square mod P, okay, with P that doesn't divide n. Then we picked a variance computed, okay, over the P in some um, dyadic interval. So between y and 2y uh, to be asymptotically given by a formula that is contains some uh, arithmetic constant um, x over four. So x, we are summing up to x. Okay, that's where the x is coming from. Then some gamma. Okay, so this gamma is going to be like the gamma that I had before, but now it's a symplectic gamma. So it's a piecewise polynomial function of degree. Okay, so the degree is different. It's 2k squared plus k minus two. And then evaluated in log x over log y minus one to the log y minus one, uh, multiplied by log y minus one to the uh, 2k squared plus k minus two power. So um, now, okay, so this is what we have. Um, we also look at a different context um, given by, so it's a different frame set different problem uh, that will also give symplectic. Uh, so this context has to do with Gaussian integers, and it has to do with um, constructing analog of Gaussian integers over function fields. And so this, um, so this construction uh, is found in a, uh, some paper of Barry Sorokers, Milansky and Wolf, and it's also used by Rudnick and Wasman who study um, distribution of Gaussian primes, again, by modeling uh, what happens over function fields. And um, the starting idea here is that if we have a P, a monic irreducible polynomial, then we can write it as A squared plus, okay, so T is my variable. So we can write it as A squared plus TB if and only if P of zero is a square on, over FQ. And this, this problem, I mean, this equation should remind you of the primes that are sum of two squares, okay? And so it's sort of an analog, analog of that. And to make it an ana, analog, we should make T to be the square of, um, minus the square of, uh, I, right? So basically what we do is we take a new variable S to be the square root of minus T. And then we see the polynomials in T inside the polynomials in S. And so this S will play the, the role of I. And so in this context, you can build the Gaussian integers, okay? Um, so this complex conjugation that is defined as you, you will expect, something that changes S to minus S, uh, over formal power series, there is a norm defined also as uh, one would expect. And then in this context, you can build um, a unit circle. And so the unit circle in question will be the um, power series whose constant coefficient is one and who have norm one. And then and then if we have this, okay, we can build sectors in this unit circle. 
and a sector will be elements in the unit circle that are closer to some point um, by some distance. Okay, and my distance is going to be the norm infinity of f is going to be q to the minus order of f. And order is the highest power of s that divides f. Now, a, another way of understanding this sector is the power series in the circle that are congruent to a modulo a high power of s. Okay, so basically you pick some point in the circle and you look at things that um, the difference with it have are divisible by high power of s. Okay, now with this, one can study the divisor function. Um, asking, okay, so I didn't define this u, but this u has to do with the angle of f. So obviously there is a way, but not obviously, but there is a way of seeing what the argument of f is, defining an argument. And then we're going to ask that the argument of f is in some particular sector of the unit circle. And then in that context, we can prove a similar result. Um, basically, we can compute the mean, and then we can compute the variance. And the variance, again, will be some integral similar to what I was describing before, but now over the symplectic uh, matrices. OK. Now, uh, I should hurry up a bit. Um, to prove this, so one important ingredient is, again, working with characters. And the characters that we need in this case are called uh, super even characters. Um, to be concrete, they are defined over uh, the polynomials modulo some power of s, OK? And super even. Um, means, okay, so in the even characters in general on FQ are the ones, FQT, are the ones that are uh, trivial over the constants, so trivial over F FQ. Here we are asking more, we're asking that they are trivial on the analog of the real numbers, which means they are trivial on the, um, essentially on the polynomials that the only powers of S are even. Okay, so they are super even characters. And uh, there's a result of Katz that says that um, these, these characters, okay, they are associated, they become uniformly distributed in uh, the symplectic loop. Now, one, there is another, okay, so there's another character that one can define on the elements on um, FQS that is just detect, um, detect the square on, of F0, okay? So this is a chi chu that is one if F0 is a square and minus one if not. Now, here's a twist, and this is pun intended. So the twist of the story is also that if you twist your character by this chi chu, there is another result by Katz that says that we get distribution on the orthogonal group. Okay, so then we can go back and cook up a problem that, okay, I have to admit it's a bit more artificial than the one I had before, okay? But we can cook up a problem that the distribution now is over the orthogonal group, okay? Now, one thing I forgot to mention before, I should have mentioned is that the first problem I showed you was had to do with congruence of a square modulo p. So it's some sort of congruence condition. And the second problem I showed you on the symplectic is you know, something lying on some uh, segment in the, uh, okay, so in some sector of the unit circle, which you can think of it as some interval somewhere. So these two problems, that I presented, they have a spirit that is associated to the original two problems that uh, we look at before. Uh, now, this is a, little, a bit harder um, to formulate because um, this is a bit harder to translate. 
um, before, okay, so before translating, one has to study what these integrals give you, okay? So in the same way as um, the other authors, they, they study the integrals over the unitary, here we study the, interval, the integrals over the symplectic and orthogonal. And because we are computing um, variance, we actually have a squares of in, associated to these integrals. We make things quite complicated in this case. Um, let me just mention some elements that show up in this study. Um, so one thing, um, so a, a big, uh, yeah, a big central point, uh, central results that we use are coming from symmetric function theory um, that basically there are these formulas that relate uh, these integrals over these products of characteristic polynomials um, to some of Schur functions. So Schur functions are um, essentially generated polynomials that count semi-standard Young tableau of uh, some sort. And so there are very beautiful results uh, such as this one okay, that allows to um, basically you can think of this as a generating function for the integrals that we want to find. And, and so basically by looking at the right-hand side, we may be able to, um, to find the integral. Um, so basically in our case, we, we have the square, so we have to specialize um, half of the variables in one way and the other half in the other way and look at diagonal terms in the generative function. And this then um, the counting of our Young tableau, semi-standard Young tableau can be related to um, counting points in a lattice, okay, inside certain polytope, okay. And then using Earhart theory, one can prove that then um, here I should say the asymptotic. It's not really the, the inter, um, is the inter, integral, but the asymptotic when n goes to infinity ends up being a polynomial of degree 2k squared plus k minus 2. And also the sum over the Schur functions can be used. Okay, so there are formulas uh, coming from representation theory that allows us to actually also compute these coefficients um, if we have enough uh, patients so in practice, I mean, when things go big, then this doesn't work very well. Um, but say, for example, if we take, um, or maybe let me let me skip that. But if, for for small values of when k is small respect to n, uh, we can compute things. When sorry, when small n is small respect to big n, and so for example, with that we can compute, um, for example, the okay, so the case when there's only one term. Uh, so the, the sum inside the, uh, the integral is just one, has just one term. Uh, we can even compute some cases when two terms and so on. Um, let me also mention that the orthogonal case is um, ended up being quite tricky. Um, so there are some, for the formula for generating function in terms of the sure function, um, we actually couldn't find it in the literature. We found a formula for dimension even, but our problem has odd dimension. Um, so we actually uh, had to recover this formula, which um, wasn't easy to do. Um, and again, uh, doing a sum of uh, Young tableau, so using the semi-standard Young tableau, we can turn this count into a lattice inside some polytope and then prove that we expect a polynomial of degree 2k squared minus k minus 2. And then with that, we can go back to the number field case and actually write conjectures. So let me maybe state everything together. Um, so for example, so for the number field case, um, what we have is if, so if we, basically what we are going to do is we're going to do the sum of decay A where A goes over the ideas that have bounded norm and 
whose direction vector is in certain sector of the unit circle. And what we mean by direction vector, um, well, is defined by this Hecke character. So basically we take a generator of the ideal and then we take the generator over the conjugate to the square. And this, and, and you look at the argument there, um, well, one fourth of the argument, and that is well-defined actually. If you change your generator, it's still well-defined. And so basically uh, with this argument, okay, so basically restricting this argument to this sector. So here's a picture that shows more or less what we are doing, okay? Um, so basically we are counting the dots in here, okay? What happens to the divisor function over those dots? Then we can formulate a conjecture, okay? Um, so here I have just formulas of what I mean by the variance. Um, let me skip over that. For the orthogonal case, um, we can also write something. Um, this is a, lit, a bit harder to kind of see in a natural way. Um, so we need to define this chi chu character that we use to twist our super even characters. And so what we do is over primes, we are going to detect when a prime is a sum of two squares, but not really. Okay, so this is a prime in the Gaussian primes. And what we write is a square plus i b square. Um, so it's really a sum of two squares in, uh, yeah, it's going to q omega eight. It's really going beyond that. Um, so again, we can now look at the divisor function distributed over these ideals using this twisted by this detector, okay? So this chi two of alpha will be, you know, alpha is defined multiplicatively. So on alpha, the condition is not so nice, um, but again, uh, we can formulate a conjecture in terms of what the variance of um, this, uh, this sum should be. Um, okay, and so basically to summarize, okay, so what we would like to do for the future, well, there is still um, some more to study of these gamma um, coefficients that uh, show up in the symplectic and the orthogonal case. Um, integral expression, what I mean by that is that in the beginning, I showed you very nice integral expression for gamma uh, in, this, in the unitary case. Um, the ones that we have for symplectic and orthogonal are not so nice. Uh, there are also questions about lower terms, like um, maybe we can study, uh, okay, so here this gamma has to do with the main coefficient, okay, the highest degree, but what about the next coefficient? This should be also possible to study. Um, understanding the arithmetic coefficient, these I really left them under the rug here. Um, the, there is some understanding that has to be done. We don't have a conjecture about what they should be. Um, so the, the, yeah, there is some work and has to be done. Um, all of what I said, in principle, one should be able to extend it to von Mangold convolutions. And we done some work on symplectic, but not on orthogonal and also not not on understanding um, everything in that case. So, so there is some work to be done there. And obviously one could ask, well, this is kind of asking much further. One could try to work with uh, functions of higher degree. Um, so there are all these directions. And with that, I thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>